hello, my name is Alex Zhavankov and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Insilico Medicine. We are focused on uh, the latest applications of uh, artificial intelligence uh, to drug discovery, biomarker development and uh, aging research. Uh, and I'm also a chief scientist uh, at the Biogerontology Research Foundation. It's a UK-based charity, 12 years old now, founded in 2008. It's called the Biogerontology Research Foundation uh, because it's fo uh, focused primarily on uh, biological and biomedical gerontology. We support research uh, worldwide and we also conduct policy uh, outreach, uh, policy documents uh, and promote aging research uh, worldwide. We got into the coronavirus uh, theme in mid-January as a company and also as an extended group of collaborators. At Insilico, we uh, decided to go directly after viral proteins. Uh, so we have the ability at Insilico to identify new targets, uh, but also also to generate uh, novel compounds very quickly uh, using uh, generative serial networks and reinforcement learning. So it's kind of uh, imaginative and strategy oriented uh, AI uh, to create molecules that specifically bind to uh, the proteins of interest. So we originally published and uh, put, put out the paper and the molecules for the 3C-like uh, main protease of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and we are working with multiple um, collaborators worldwide to provide uh, molecules for their proteins of interest. And also we are generating a bunch of others. However, for the purposes of this paper, we are not using AI in any way. It's human intelligence. And it is uh, quite obvious that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 is uh, more harmful to the elderly, to people over 50. So it's more, it's infecting more people over uh, uh, 50. It is uh, much more severe and much more lethal in that uh, age group. So that is why uh, it's actually pretty unique compared to other viruses. So if you look at influenza uh, and uh, other common viruses, uh, we do not see, like adenovirus, we do not see such effect in the elderly. So it's uh, a little bit more equal opportunity infections. For SARS-CoV-2, it infects uh, mostly uh, the elderly. And there is actually no term to describe it right now. So in the paper that I put forward in aging, I propose a new term. So it's uh, gerophilic and uh, gerolavic infection from uh, Greek uh, gegeros, uh, old man, and uh, epilavis, harmful. So it's more harmful to the elderly, more severe in the elderly. And gerophilic, uh, it's uh, geros again, old man, and philia is love. So it uh, loves old people. And uh, if we look at the data from Wuhan in China, you will see that 90% uh, of the population, 89.7% of the population who got the virus were over 30 and 99.2 percent of the population uh, uh, that died of it were over 30. So it's uh, really an uneven distribution of, of uh, both uh, severe cases and uh, lethal cases in the population. And uh, one of the really important uh, case studies uh, that has been studied quite uh, extensively is the Diamond Princess cruise ship. So on kind of um, the world's uh, most watched lab that uh, came into attention because uh, a few thousand people uh, got stuck, very diverse uh, population group got stuck uh, on one uh, cruise boat. And out of uh, those uh, few thousand, I think around 700 contracted uh, the virus. And uh, most of them were over uh, 65. And there were originally seven deaths. A few more people died. And uh, we see that people who had the infection, even with mild symptoms, uh, they have uh, dark spots in their lungs on CT. So it looks like they have some lesions and uh, uh, there is some fibrosis. Uh, so it's not, it's, even if the disease uh, has mild symptoms, uh, the elderly more so, uh, it leaves uh, the fibrotic trace. And um, in the paper, I'm hypothesizing that uh, the disease is associated with immunosenescence, uh, so both the involution of the thymus and uh, many other processes that lead to immunosenescence. Uh, immunosenescence leads to infection, so here you have, uh, of course, chances of death. Infection leads to more damage and loss of homeostasis. That leads to accelerated aging and also acceleration of age-related pathology. 
pathology also increase the chances of death that lead to more immunosenescence. So it's kind of the virtual, vicious circle of uh, immunosenescence and infection. And um, there have been many studies in the past showing that uh, some of the geroprotectors uh, like uh, serolimus uh, rapamycin uh, may be effective in uh, potentiating response to vaccines and also preventing infection in the elderly. So it's paradoxical observation that uh, immunosuppressant like rapamycin might have immunostimulatory effects and uh, there was anecdotal evidence showing that it kind of protects uh, the elderly from uh, influenza and other viruses, not infections. It's pretty obvious to try something like rapamycin that is reasonably safe in low doses. So in high doses, it has uh, uh, substantial side effects, uh, but in uh, low doses, it uh, is not uh, it's very well tolerated. So there are other what is called repologs. One is a very famous one. It's called Everolimus. It's a very close structural analog to Serolimus developed by Novartis, which is claimed to be selective to specific proteins in a TOR complex that make it uh, more beneficial to the, for, for, for aging and for uh, other uh, diseases. However, I would really like to see more evidence of that because those are very close structural analogs. And um, there are other inhibitors that that serve the same purpose. So 2013, Novartis conducted a few experiments with Everolimus. Uh, that, that drug is called RAD001 and uh, demonstrated uh, that in healthy elderly patients, uh, low dose treatment with RAD001 results in uh, immune potentiation and uh, less infection uh, with influenza and also potentiation of, of vaccines. So that was promising news. In 2018, uh, so they published in 2014 on science translation medicine and it was a very promising study. Then in uh, 2018, uh, they show that uh, uh, a combination of uh, Everolimus and another TOR inhibitor also results in immune potentiation and uh, prevention of uh, several uh, infections, primarily influenza. So for influenza, they published uh, in Science for Translational Medicine. And a spin-off out of Novartis Restore Bio uh, took those molecules into clinic, so uh, into phase three. And in phase three, they decided to, instead of uh, using Everlimus, they used a molecule called PES-235, rebranded as uh, RTB-101, which had high concentrations it's also a PI3K inhibitor, so it's not a very selective inhibitor of uh, TOR, and they failed in phase three. So, but they haven't used RAD001 or serolimus uh, to in combination or as control. I believe that it's likely to be because of the molecule and also the patient uh, selection. So it should be a biomarker used for that. But those promising early experiments and clinical studies with RAD001 and also substantial uh, evidence from the clinic, meta-studies showing that uh, rapamycin is potentiating uh, a vaccine response and immune, uh, immune status in the elderly. That gives us very promising data to try serolimus in phase three in low doses, maybe once a week, maybe in combination with other geroprotectors like metformin, like NAD boosters, uh, like synolytics to potentiate uh, the immune system of the elderly before they get sick. Uh, so in this paper, I also want to highlight that uh, it's not a medical advice, it's not a recommendation. It's a call for clinical trials of an alternative alternative view on how to address uh, COVID-19, uh, so SARS-CoV-2, and prevent infection and uh, increase uh, survival in the elderly and also make it less severe for the elderly. So in this paper, I'm calling for clinical trials of uh, rapamycin, a very well-known geroprotector. Uh, it's actually, um, it was implicated in aging by uh, Professor Michael uh, Blagasklonny at Roosevelt Park in uh, early 2000s, so 2004, 2005, 2006, with seminal papers uh, showing that uh, cancer agent uh, is very likely to be also an anti-aging compound. And I now believe that uh, this uh, compound should be tried in uh, multiple uh, age-associated uh, pathologies and also for immune senescence, uh, reversing immune senescence. But other geroprotectors, promising geroprotectors like metformin, can be very well combined with uh, rapamycin. And 
NID boosters like nicotinamide riboside, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, may be tried uh, in clinical trials. Senolytics, these could be tried uh, also after COVID because uh, of the uh, fibrotic buildup, fibrosis in the lungs, and also as uh, rehabilitation after uh, COVID. I think that uh, some other promising uh, geroprotectors, uh, including FOXP3 activation, again, that's much less explored, uh, could lead to aging clocks. So since 2013, there's been a revolution in aging clocks, uh, starting from uh, Panem and uh, Horvath work, showing that methylation data is very predictive of logical age, and uh, there are very highly accurate markers of uh, aging. Uh, but there are many others, so like blood tests, very simple clinical blood tests can be used to predict chronological age, and my group uh, published uh, the first ones. Uh, using deep learning. And there are many others, including microbiomic aging clock, uh, including imaging aging clocks, uh, including including transcriptomic aging clocks and proteomic aging clocks. And whatever data there is, uh, longitudinal data that could be used uh, to construct clocks should be collected during the clinical trials. And uh, we should look at whether some of the molecules are making you younger or older compared to the chronological age from uh, the various data types uh, and uh, look at the effects. So that's the current uh, proposal in the paper. So I'm calling for to try GERA protectors to protect the elderly, to potentiate their immune response uh, to COVID, and also to try the aging clocks for for both clinical trials enrollment and for monitoring to see what uh, molecules are making you younger or older on uh, pretty much any every level. And I'm also calling for uh, those clinical trials because after COVID-19, after the epidemic is over, we're going to have major economic consequences because a lot of people have been out of work. There's been substantial capital influx uh, from pretty much every government into the economy. So quantitative easing, easing that might uh, lead to inflation. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to the economies of uh, developed countries. Previously, I published uh, several papers in a book on economics of aging, showing that uh, increases in productive longevity would lead to substantial economic growth. And if we manage to reduce uh, the amount of money being spent on health care healthcare in the elderly by preventing disease and by rejuvenating uh, the elderly, making them uh, more resilient to disease, just that lead to unprecedented economic growth. And of course, if we make them more productive and uh, uh, contributing to the uh, labor force longer, we would see unprecedented economic growth uh, even further. So we're talking about double digit uh, growth uh, in developed countries. So here we can kill many birds with one stone, so to speak, even though I don't like the word kill. And uh, we can uh, try GERA protectors to uh, prevent disease. But at the same time, uh, we can uh, boost the economy after the epidemic is over if some of those uh, GERA protectors uh, show efficacy and people start believing more that aging is plastic and we can uh, push the envelope in that area and really rejuvenate the elderly. So that's the paper and thank you very much for watching this. Stay healthy.